Um, Obviously, I got Hassani here on stage, and Hassani is on staff with us here at 12 Song, but I want him to share a little bit about uh, his journey, his, you know, your life. You're, you're a stranger to many people, and so uh, give us just a snapshot. Just a sliver. <laughs> a sliver okay. of, of your life, yeah. So born and raised in New Jersey, um, okay. married for 15 years, uh, have four children, all girls. Somebody Ooh. pray for me. We're going to pray for you <laughs> after. Um, uh, moved down here to Atlanta about six years ago after traveling around the world and living abroad and enjoying that experience, but came down here. And my background is actually, I'm a marriage coach. I'm an infidelity recovery specialist. So I deal with couples who are in crisis, those on the verge of divorce, those that really want to restore their relationship. But I've always been in ministry as well. And a few years ago, God uh, led me to, to start a church. Hmm. I was a member of 12 Stone. I attended the Sugarloaf Campus. Yeah. And then God sent me off to start a church. So we planted a church for about a year. And as I was praying for vision, he said, you know what? I, I caused you to start this, but not to, not to lead this, not to run it. So I installed a new pastor, and, and God told me to come, back, come on back home and join the staff at 12 Stone. So I'm, I'm glad to be home. Let's go. We're glad to have you, man. <laughs> I'm pumped. Thank you. Uh, before we go any further, <laughs> uh, four girls. Four girls. How, uh, how old? Uh, well, Paris is 14, Madison is 13, Savannah is 10, and Sydney is 8. Wow, unbelievable. So tell me this. Now I'm just curious. We have a lot of guys in the room who are dating young women. Uh, as a father of four girls, <laughs> what, what would you say to these guys? You know, just, you know. Brothers, don't mess up. <laughs> All right. Treat these ladies right, because guess what? Life happens in cycles and what you do, you're going to get. You know, somebody once said, you don't reap where All the girls you sow. Say, yeah, amen. I know, right? <laughs> Someone said, you don't reap where you sow, but you do reap what you sow. Yeah. So whatever the seeds that you're sowing now, trust and believe is coming back. So if you treat them right, then you will raise up daughters that will attract the right guys who will treat them right. Come on. That's a whole other sermon. We'll bring you back for that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to jump in, just jump right into this, uh, the topic of unity. So I guess probably the best place to start is, you know, in your opinion, or what do you think, what are, what are some of the roadblocks to us being unified? I mean, unity, it seems to be really difficult in today's world. What would you say some of the roadblocks are to us being well, united? I think the reality is when it comes to roadblocks or barriers, one of the biggest barriers that prevent us from being united is that we have a tendency of looking at the world through our natural eyes, but we truly don't have the heart of God. And if we don't have the heart of God, then we're going to rely on our own reasoning, right, in order to determine and define who people are. So as I look through my natural lenses, I see differences. I see male. I see female. I see black, I see white, I see tall, I see short, I see muscular, I see athletic frames. I see all of these differences. Now, the Bible says that, God, that man looks on outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And if we're not looking through spiritual eyes and with the heart of God, we will allow differences to divide us. But God says that he wants differences to unite us. He wants us to see the diversity, not just the difference. And it kind of makes me think about a scripture uh, that I came across that I've read time and time again. Some of us may be familiar with it. Some of us may not be. But the theme is unity through diversity. And if we look at 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 12th through the 26th verse, I'm not going to read all of it, but some of it I want to I point out. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, so my body is one body, but I have different members. You all are the body of Christ, but individually you represent different members, correct? Hello, somebody. All right, so for as the body is one and has many members, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. 
It goes on to say that if there were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head can say to the feet, I have no need of you. Not much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Now this is deep. Seems to be. I think that we have a tendency of looking at people through our own perspective, through our own lenses, through our own interpretations, and it seems to be a problem. They seem to be weaker because we're looking at our, through our eyes and not through the heart of God. But it goes on to say, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body. I'll stop there. Schism, if we know what schism means, it truly means division. Think of the word schism, ism. In this country, we have classism, racism, sexism, feminism, chauvinism. And all of these are ideologies and all of these are beliefs and creeds that we adopt that create division. But the Bible says that there should be no division in the body of Christ. And if we truly understand that our individuality represents the diversity that God seeks, it allows us to see with our spiritual eyes as we have a heart for God. So when we understand who God is and have a divine relationship with him, there are no barriers to, to unity because his, his love is imprinted on our heart. Does that make sense? Absolutely. The roadblock is our eyes. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. so I think uh, someone once said something so powerful, diversity plus maturity is strength. Hmm. And so as we mature in God, we look at diversity as an awesome thing because we all benefit from the differences that we all collectively bring to the table. Diversity plus maturity equals strength. You can write that down if you want. You don't have to, but <laughs> it's fine. I, what I love about that equation is I think oftentimes when stuff breaks down in culture, we blame it on diversity, when I think in reality it's actually maturity that's broken down. Exactly. And that's why we don't have strength. It wasn't, it wasn't the fact that there was diversity. Yeah. It was the fact that there wasn't maturity and with the diversity. Right. And that's why we're not strong together. And as you develop a relationship with God, as you begin to read his word, as you pray, you become more mature as a believer, and then you begin to accept the differences in others. Yeah. And when those things happen, you begin to adopt the heart of God. Exactly. And you begin to see with the heart of God, not just with your own eyes. Amen. Love it. Um, so next question I would have for you is, does God, does God want us all to be the same? Like, can we talk about unity? So does that mean we all just, uh, you know, we're trying to be the same type of person? Well, I don't think that that could be possible because there's so much diversity here in this room. And even if we look at the Bible in Genesis, uh, we know that the scripture says pertaining to men and women, a man should leave his father and mother, cleave into his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So God wants us to enter into oneness. But oneness is not synonymous with sameness. He doesn't want us to be the same he wants us to become one. And so I think that if we all were the same, like if I married my wife and my wife was the same as me, then one of us would become obsolete, yeah. right? I would have no need for her. She would have no need for me. But because of her individuality, her self-expression, her own uniqueness, she brings something to the relationship that I could not bring. And so I need her difference. I need her individuality to make the union a much better union. So I believe that God is saying that he does not want us to be the same, but he wants us, he wants us to enter into oneness through our diversity. So in essence, he's looking for unity, not uniformity. Mm. Think about it. If you go to Chick-fil-A, everyone, generally speaking, should have on the same uniform. And so it would imply if they're wearing the same uniform, they are the same, they are one. But no, if those uniforms are removed, you would probably see that there are many differences that could create division. So uniformity is not the answer. True unity is the answer. It, it, and, and when you understand your greatness, right, if you understand who you are as an individual, then you can begin to celebrate the differences in others. I say all the time that uh, compatibility isn't being just like another person. Compatibility is identifying the differences and celebrating them to figure out how you can make that work in the relationship that you have with that person. So the differences add to the collective strength. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Yeah, makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, how, like, I, I think this, at some point this comes, this all sounds good, unity sounds good, and, um, but then the question breaks down to how do, like, how do I change my life? Like, what does this mean for me as a believer in the everyday life and work and school and just, like, how does, how do I begin to change who I am to begin to unify with other people, you know? I think it's important for us to understand that we're triune beings, meaning there's three aspects of who we are. We're spirit, soul, and body, right? So we're spiritual beings housed in a physical body, and we possess a soul. Now, if I look at your physical body, I'm going to automatically see the difference. But we're not bodies that have spirits and have souls. We're spiritual beings housed in a body, and we possess a soul. And so when you think about that triune being existence, if the spirit is running the system, that unites us. Because the same spirit that's in me is the same spirit that's right. in you. If I allow my soul to run the system, my soul is comprised of what? My mind, my will, my emotions, my thought, my intellect, my reasoning. And if I live my life based upon my reasoning, my reasoning has been drenched and soaked and saturated in experiences and things handed down to me from society, media perspectives, and that shapes who I am and what I become. But if I truly know that God is on the inside of me and I connect to that, then that will allow me to become who he wants me to be, and that will allow me to connect to the God that's in everyone in this room. Does that make so? So that's what we need. Spiritual maturity allows us to establish that connection that we need. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's, yeah. And so, you know, the, the reality is this. I, I once heard a powerful story, and it, and it speaks about the greatness that is on the inside of us. But if you don't know who you are, you live beneath your privilege. And I want to let each and every one of you know that you're powerful, that you're great, that when God created you, he created a masterpiece. Why? Because there's a piece of the master on the inside of each and every one of you. And it kind of reminds me of a story that I once heard about an eagle who lost her egg one day. And so this tiny eagle egg was found by a mother hen. And so this mother hen, this chicken, took this egg and, and ran back to the chicken coop and sat on this egg with the loving patience of a pregnant mother. And it was just a few weeks later that this egg would hatch and out would step a tiny baby eagle. Now, this is an eagle that had eagle's genes, eagle's chromosomes, eagle's power, and eagle's potential. But because he was raised in a chicken environment, he did not know who he was. So he began to dream chicken dreams and think chicken thoughts and played chicken games, and he even entertained chicken ambitions. And his only obstacle in life was to hop, skip, and jump on top of a fence post and to cock a doo 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 like a rooster because he did not know who, in fact, he was. And so one day, while this confused bird was playing with the other chickens in the chicken coop, all of a sudden, flying in the sky was an adult male eagle. And when he saw this confused bird, he swooped down to the ground and said, Boy, you ain't no chicken. You're an eagle. And your talons were never meant to rake and scrape the ground for worms and feed, but they were meant to snatch the stony sides of mountains. Boy, he said, you ain't no chicken. You are an eagle. And your wings were never meant to be limited to the narrow confines of a barnyard, but they were meant to stretch forth as you soar into the sky into your own immeasurable genius. Boy, he said, you ain't no chicken. You are an eagle. And until you recognize that you are an eagle, you will never rise to your greatness. There's so much power. There's so much God power on the inside of you. But if you live in the shadow of your own existence, you won't know the true God in you and what God can do through your life. And so once you begin to identi identify your spiritual identity, that's where the power lies. And when we understand our spiritual identity, I can connect to the spirit in each and every one of you. And all of these differences mean nothing anymore because we have something common together. We have a fabric that is interwoven into our lives, and that fabric is Christ. That's good.
We've, we've talked about this a little bit before, and you spoke about the learn, I think it was learn, yes. love, lead. Mm-hmm. Those are three things. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit more? I, I think the way that we can overcome the isms, the divisions, and form true unity. You know, when God, when God was speaking to me about, you know, joining 12 Stone and, and coming on staff, he said, son, I want you to do three things. He said, I want you to learn, love, and lead. So every individual that you meet, Take the time to learn about them. See, because, because isolation breeds ignorance. If, if I choose not to... Say it again. Say it again. Isolation breeds ignorance. But on the flip side of that, proximity is power. When I'm in close proximity with my brother and I take the time to learn him, and I have a teachable heart and a teachable spirit, then I'm going to learn something unique about you that I didn't know before. You know, one of the the things that I always say, because I have a men's group that I work with, and, and one of my biggest mantras, if you will, mottos, is every man needs a man. And I say that because as a man, my manhood is based upon my upbringing, my experience, what my father showed me. And as great as an example as he was, it was a very limited example. You as a man probably had a different upbringing. And so when I can connect with you and get to know you, there are aspects about your manhood that I could probably benefit and glean from. So me connecting with you helps to make me more complete as a man. Does that make sense? So if we take that out of the context of manhood and just deal with each other as individuals, when we take the time to connect and learn who the other person is, there are some gifts and talents and abilities and perspective and wisdom them and, and, and you know it's all types of things in a person that we can glean from so he said learn to learn to learn learn to learn from people he said also I need you to love people everybody that you encounter try to figure out how can I love you I, I, I don't know you man I, I, what's your name Grant and so if I take the time to get to know him and learn him, then my God is going to say, well, how can you love on Grant? And I think that's what all of us need to do. We need to have that heartfelt connection that binds us together. And, and then the third thing, lead with your life. See, it's one thing to believe the word of God. It's one thing to call ourselves a Christian. But how do you live your life? Are you living the scriptures? Are you the walking, talking, living, breathing manifestation of the word of God? If so, then you are li- not just talking the talk, but you're walking your talk. And if you walk your talk, you're truly leading in the area of which you believe. And as you lead by example, that is the best witness that you could ever have for other people. And so we need to understand and my time is running up. We need to understand nope. that in this country, <laughs> in this country, we live in a, in, a, in a great country called America. And I've traveled all over the world and there are great nations all over the place. But we have to realize that there are isms. There are differences. There, there, there are all types of um, inequalities that exist in the world. But it reminds me of the Declaration of, Pendence, of, of Independence. And it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to serve these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that when any form of government is destructive to these ends, it is the will of the people to alter and to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them that seem fit for their safety and happiness. And what that says as believers is that even though we are citizens of this nation, as children of God, we are citizens of a higher nation. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that Jesus is the king of the kingdom. Jesus is the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords. And the Bible says that the government shall be upon his shoulders. And even though we're citizens of this nation, we're citizens of heaven. And it is our job and our responsibility, even when we pray the Lord's Prayer. We, what do we pray? Thy, we pray that thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're calling on the kingdom of God and the culture of the kingdom to come down on earth. And if we live the culture of the kingdom, all of the other differences that have divided us simply don't matter. Now, if we're truly living a kingdom life, the Bible says that we're ambassadors of who? Of Christ. Now, think about an ambassador. An ambassador typically lives in an embassy or a consulate. 
An ambassador lives in a foreign country but represents the home country. So if we are ambassadors of Christ representing the kingdom of God, we are foreign citizens in this nation representing another kingdom. So our homes should represent an embassy. Inside the embassy should represent the culture of the kingdom. If I were to go into the embassy of, let's just say, pick a country, France, in the United States, when I enter into that embassy, I'm no longer in the United States. I've just entered into a new jurisdiction. If I wage war on the people inside the embassy of France, I've waged war on France. We have a problem. And so your home should represent the kingdom of God, the culture of heaven. And so if you truly represent the culture of heaven, then that means that we have our own government. We have our own laws. We have our own amendments. And when we live according to this word, it allows us to connect with other individuals. And hatred, which this world is soaked in, is stamped out by love, which this Bible is based upon. This is our government. These are our laws. We serve a God that is above every other thing in this earth and when we serve him we learn how to serve one another we don't have to pay attention to the clock <laughs> anything else anything else you want to add that was simply I, yeah. simply there's a scripture if i could end with the scripture because i want to be respectful of time um in first peter the third chapter the eighth verse says finally here, here here is the Bible speaking to each and every one of you through the writer. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. That is our responsibility as believers. One thing I love about 12 Stone, there's such diversity in this place. Diversity, which should breed unity. When you think about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is represented by every living thing that God created. There's a powerful scripture that found in Romans. This is so powerful. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. I'm going to read this twice. I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to break it down. It says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His internal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what he has made, so that people are without excuse. Now, I'm going to read it slow and break it down. For since the creation of the world, meaning since Genesis chapter 1, when he created the heavens and the earth during those six days, since the beginning, God's invisible qualities. Now, God, we can't see God. God is invisible, correct? Yeah. But it says that his invisible qualities, well, what qualities are those? Number one, his eternal power. And number two, his divine nature have been clearly seen. So in essence, this is saying that we can see the invisible God. How? Being understood from what has been made. So if we look at the creation of God, we see the nature of God. God's DNA is imprinted in his nature. It's imprinted in his creation. So let me ask you, are you created in God's image? Are you created in God's image? Are you, talk to me, are you created in God's image? This is a woman. This is a man. This man is black. That man is white. There's so much diversity. But everything that God created we can see his uniqueness. We can see his nature through his creation. So whenever you look at somebody and you begin to judge and to criticize who they are, what you're telling them, what you're telling yourself is that God made a mistake. That's in essence what you're saying. And if we believe that God is a powerful God, an infallible God who does not make mistakes, a God who cannot lie, as you see your brother and sister, you should see the God on the inside of them. And when we look through spiritual eyes and have a true heart for God, we can truly have unity, which I'm beginning to see at 12 Stone. We represent something that many churches around the world are striving for. You are in a unique position. Embrace it. 
Get a chance to get to know one another. Don't just worship next to somebody and don't even touch them, talk to them, get to know them. This is a family right here. Right. And when you operate as a family, we all win. Amen? Amen. Amen. Man, thank you so much for taking time. Uh, Hassani's pretty, pretty new around here, and, and I had one conversation with him, and immediately I was like, I need you to come talk. Uh, it was pretty quickly. I, I knew I wanted him in my corner. I just, you. I just have one ask. Yeah. Can I come back? I. <laughs> would, would that be all right? Please. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I know you got a family and you took it tonight. So thanks, man. Appreciate you. Can we give it up for him one more time? Thank you.